The exodus of San Diego police officers for better pay elsewhere has city leaders groping for solutions. Why justice can be elusive when it comes to investigating rape on college campuses. And many veterans' charities get poor grades in a watchdog report. I'm Mark Sauer, and the KPBS Roundtable starts now. Welcome. It's Friday, November 14th. I'm Mark Sauer. And joining me at the KPBS Roundtable today are Gene Cubison, political reporter for NBC7 San Diego. Hi, Gene. Hello, Mark. My pleasure. Thanks. And KPBS reporter Angela Carone. Good to have you, Angela, today. Hi, Mark. And UT San Diego watchdog reporter Jeff McDonald. Good to see you back, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Well, a new study by the city of San Diego shows that police officers are at or near the bottom of pay scales compared with other departments. It's not quite time to change the motto to protect and starve, but the pay comparison is startling in many cases. Uh, Gene, start, uh, start by telling us what this study was all about. What did they look at? Well, it was a study that uh, the conclusion should have been well known, but for so many years uh, they were in denial and wanted to remain in denial that uh, San Diego just really does not pay very generously its officers. And for too many years the city has been, uh, you would say, whistling past graveyards in terms of public safety. And it's probably just the fact that it is a very efficient force, lean, mean force, that this is somewhat of a chill community compared to other urban areas, that they have gotten away with relatively manageable crime rates, but now it's starting to show the attrition and uh, the, uh, the loss of morale, frankly, from what I'm hearing from both uh, active duty and retired police officers uh, with the compensation and uh, the work, uh, work situations. And it's an objective thing. I mean, the, the, the union didn't uh, sponsor this study or, or pay for this study. This was a city-funded thing. Well, but there was militating. It is very well known that uh, just, from the, uh, just from the attrition figures, 300 a year, they can't replace. Uh, so often uh, officers are retiring. Um, to make sure that they get the maximum benefits that uh, that they possibly can get. Officers are living uh, in other counties, uh, particularly Riverside County, or in places that are more affordable than the city of San Diego. Uh, morale is down. They're seeing neighboring police departments and law enforcement agencies paying more, actually uh, giving, uh, giving recruiting bonuses. And uh, as they looked up and down the state, they said, hey, uh, we're, uh, we're a third world nation here in terms of law enforcement. Mm -hmm. I did want to ask about, uh, to give uh, uh, the audience an idea here, the difference in some of these uh, 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 pay rates between a veteran officer, say a veteran San Diego police officer, a street cop, here and in some of the other uh, cities, according to the union, in a couple of years when the contract will be up. Well, we're seeing it as much as 20%. Uh, 20% mm -hmm. uh, certainly locally, but uh, this is for the average, but when you look at San Diego versus San Francisco, mm -hmm. uh, closer to 40%. Mm -hmm. And what are the, what are the, what are the actual salary figures there? Well, the is San Diego 82,731, San Francisco 128,567. Uh, what you have to add in here is the working conditions because San Diego probably has among, if not the leanest force in terms of number of officers, the ratio per to population per 100,000. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is 1.4 in Los Angeles and uh, in San Francisco, it's double that. Wow. And in other big cities, it's even more than that. And this is a city of some hmm, 350 square miles. San Francisco's 50. I, I mean, the patrol areas that they have to cover geographically. Geographically, they're doing a heck of a job. Right. Yeah, right. yeah, for for very little. Now, you mentioned that uh, crime rate, remarkably, stays relatively um, low, and it's dropped in recent years. It over, is over remarkable, time. and it has to do a lot with the quality of the officers they have been able to get, and that is a concern now going forward as the, uh, as the attraction of other agencies reaches out. But uh, also, we're seeing the effects of AB 109. Uh, violent crime has not exploded exactly, but property crime has, and I think some of the sex sexual crimes as well. And they're starting to, uh, they may begin to see out on the streets an erosion of that. Fortunately, the city for a long time has had a very, very novel, innovative neighborhood policing policy and is a very efficient police force, as I say, but um, it's a thin blue line. And at some point, um, it's, it's inevitably, uh, there's a fear that it's going to fray. Now, we, uh, it's not just a salary difference. I think you alluded to San Diego spends time and money training recruits. They see other departments steal them away. Here's what uh, the police chief, Shelley G Zimmerman, had to say about the situation on KPBS Evening Edition. Last year, we hired 160 police officers. We spent millions of dollars to do that. It costs about $191,000 in investment costs to bring somebody on for their first year of training. 
but unfortunately we lost 162 last year. So after all of that, we were negative two. This year, I'm, I'm very grateful to Mayor Faulkner that we have the ability to hire more than 170 police officers. But as last year showed, we have to be able to keep them. And they're giving some bonuses to lure some of these folks away. Well, yeah, you've got two agencies here in San Diego County, the uh, the Sheriff's Department and Chula Vista. There are other, uh, one more throughout the state. Uh, $5,000 signing bonuses. Uh, my understanding is, though, you have to stay five years to accrue that benefit, but uh, they went through a whole uh, series of matrices, matrices, holiday pay, overtime, bilingual bonuses, tuition reimbursement, sick leave, other fringe benefits. Um, some of these are apples, oranges, bananas, but uh, San Diego comes out at the bottom of those barrels is the problem. And uh, one thing, it doesn't help that there's this, uh, there's this five-year pay freeze uh, among the city of San Diego employees. So management, uh, the mayor, they're starting to say all the right things. Gosh, we got to do something about this. But they let it go so long right. that, they're, uh, that they're fighting a catch-up game here. Uh, back when the economy tanked and city finances went into the dumper and they started uh, uh, blacking out uh, oh, eight engines a day, about a fifth of the yeah. fire department. Yeah, we had the brownouts in the fire department. Public, they let public safety slide down a slippery slope. Right. Now, Jeff, you've got kids. I've got kids who are a little older than yours and all. Is it time for people who live in the neighborhoods to start feeling uh, a little less safe here with this situation? I don't think it's time for people to start feeling less safe, but they certainly should be concerned. And this may generate the political will that's necessary to steer more resources to this to this mm -hmm. problem because it's not news right. to the uh, to the people in charge. Well, and it's always a problem that they San Diego waits until it becomes a crisis, mm -hmm. and so then it's dealt with in a crisis uh, helter skelter fashion. No, I wondered about. I mean, you know, the recession and so forth, the five year pay freeze, but how did other cities handle the recession in terms of, because obviously San Francisco is not facing the same kind of situation? Well, I, you'd like to say maybe it's economies of scale, maybe it's that other jurisdictions are far less uh, tax averse than San Diego historically has been, not just the city of San Diego, but Didn't all the cities. Didn't underfund their pensions and have to catch up over Things time. like that, exactly. Because San Diego made so many elemental bedrock mistakes that it had to throw, uh, let's just say, bad money after good, or, mm -hmm. or how, how you'd want to put mm -hmm. it. Perhaps the only way that they're going to be able to find this money is to reprioritize or actually jack up, if not taxes, then fees. The fees for alarm responses, the fees for uh, uh, nightclub permits, the fees for all sorts of things that have to do with law enforcement, which are really taxes, but they may just have to say, look, these aren't just to cover the costs of our enforcement and our inspection and processing. It's actually to raise revenue for some of these things. It's, nope. it's, going, to be, it's going to be a real challenge to find that extra money somewhere. Well, Mayor Faulkner made this an issue during this recent special election campaign earlier this year. Um, and what does he say about these pay inequities and exodus for officers? He's concerned. I mean, the, the chief there alluded in that clip we played. Well, um, I, th I think, as I said, he's saying all the right things. He's expressing the requisite amount of concern. And we must hope that uh, the best and brightest minds of his administration and the council can come together with these, uh, with these very targeted responses in terms of revenue and in terms of, uh, like I say, reprioritizing or better spending the money and finding cuts that are not so painful. But, uh, but that's, it's going to be a huge challenge. Do we see a Republican mayor raise taxes here to pay for a specific thing like this? Uh, uh, I wouldn't hold tax? your breath for that. Yeah. Uh, they'll probably find extra revenue by raising fees, as Jim yeah. suggested. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and pick it up over time. Well, 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 it's an interesting story, and I'm sure we'll hear more of it, and the police union won't, uh, won't let it die as we go forward. No, no, no. They, uh, they're they're going to be at the table. and. Uh, they're going to be very insistent that, uh, that this be rectified and remedied. All right, we're going to move on. Uh, sexual violence on college campuses has gotten scant attention over the years, but that's starting to change. Public universities in California and elsewhere have launched programs to address the issue and support victims. Angela, you found this problem is uh, far more widespread than most people realize. Yeah, I mean, the studies vary on this, but um, the experts that I spoke with talked about, they framed it in terms of sexual violence, and that can mean anything from sexual assault to dating or domestic violence to date rape to harassment. Um, so in the context of sexual violence, experts say that one in four or five students will experience some version of this during their college years. And then across the board, though, um, law enforcement and school administrators, rape crisis um, advocates, they all say that this is a very underreported crime. And you, uh, you brought this to life in your, your series on KPBS by, uh, by uh, using
using the case of a 20-year-old woman, you called her Jennifer, and this mm -hmm. was, it's interesting because it goes back to 2007, mm -hmm. which shows you how the whole thing played out and what's happened in her life and, and that of the, uh, of, uh, of her ex-boyfriend in mm -hmm. this case. Uh, tell us about that rape case she reported in 2007. Well, Jennifer was in a, a nine-month-long relationship. Um, he grew increasingly uh, controlling. There was some physical abuse, and it kind of all com culminated in one weekend in which um, she says that on one night he raped her, and then on the second night um, he uh, beat her up, is mm -hmm. what she says. And she reported both to the police and then to the school's um, Title IX office, and that's what launched the school investigation. Okay, and on that second night she's outside, she's in distress, some folks come to her that's aid, right. and their 911 call is made, and she figures, okay, finally it's out in the open, the police are here, and kind of the cavalry is coming, right. and this nightmare is going to be over, but it was never that simple, was it? No, I mean, when you're talking about a criminal investigation, I mean, these these cases are, are not prosecuted very often. I mean, you're talking about, you know, a prosecutor's job is to compile a case that they can take to the jury and prove beyond a reasonable doubt that this happened. Most sexual assaults occur with two people in the room, and that's it. And so it becomes a kind of he said, she said situation. In these college campus situations, you have um, often there's alcohol involved. If the assault happened at a party, you have you know possible witnesses who are also drunk, may well be drunk. Not um, be it's reliable, hard obviously. not be reliable. So there are all kinds of reasons why these are really tough cases. I ended up speaking with the prosecutor who handled Jennifer's case, and he said, you know, the toughest part of my job a lot of the time is to sit in front of a survivor or victim and have to say to them, look. I may believe you, mm -hmm. but I have to take this to a jury to prove, and I can't. Mm -hmm. I just can't do it. So this happens a lot. So then that's why these campus judicial processes are sometimes um, offer a different route to, to survivors um, to, to achieve some kind of justice, some version of it. So uh, the assailant in this case spent a, a night in jail, as you say, was not prosecuted ultimately. So that left her with the uh, SDSU, San Diego mm -hmm. State Judicial college system, the university system. Explain uh, that and how she entered that. Uh, that well, it's different. So phase. it's, um, the, I think the most, the biggest difference between the criminal justice system and the campus judicial system is the standard of evidence that needs, so the standard of proof that is. Um, in the campus judicial system, it's called a preponderance of evidence. So looking at all of the evidence before you, if you looking at it and you think, well, this more likely than not happened. So it's a more likely than not standard. It's a much lower burden of then proof beyond than a reasonable beyond doubt. a reasonable right. doubt. So um, with that standard of proof, then she filed a Title IX complaint. She went through the hearing process. And um, there's an investigation that's run. Um, and then it goes to a hearing. The, before it goes to a hearing, the investigator, who acts as a kind of prosecutor in the hearing, it's a Title IX coordinator, um, goes to the accused and says, this is what we found in our investigation. And this is what the punishment or the this is the violation that, that you committed, and this is what we're going to seek for punishment. And he can or she can agree to sign off on that or say, no, I disagree. I wanted to go to a hearing. Mm -hmm. And at the hearing, um, uh, the uh, alleged assailant has an attorney present. The victim does right. not. Well, the victim can. So, so she was told she couldn't have an attorney. But by SDSU policy, she can. Now that they both the, the victim and the accused can have attorneys. The attorneys can't speak for the students. The entire idea of the campus judicial process is for it to be educational. It's not necessarily to be punitive. Right. And so the idea is that the student really will the goal, learn, learn that's something. what they yeah. say. And don't forget, these campus judicial processes are in place to handle a whole range of things from cheating on a paper to stealing a roommate's computer to pulling a fire alarm in the dorm to sexual assault. So it's all that's part the of the thing. same process. And where it gets tricky and thorny, of course, is when you're dealing with complex felonies right. like sexual assault. Right. So um, there's, it's run by a faculty member or a staff member who gets three hours or so of training a year. They act as kind of a judge. It looks a lot like a court. There's not a jury, but there is a prosecutor, someone who acts as kind of a prosecutor, and then both the victim and the accused can have attorneys. The attorneys can't speak. The student has to speak for themselves, but they can advise through like side notes and side conversation. Now, you interviewed uh, Joe Cohn, policy director at the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education uh, via Skype. Let's see what... Uh, what he has to say about uh, college campuses dealing with sexual assault. Especially when they're trying to do this without the benefit of forensics evidence, without the benefit of years of expertise, 
And without the benefit of the tools that law enforcement professionals and courts bring to bear to sort out fact and fiction, expecting them to do this well is crazy. Now, that kind of <laughs> sums it up, doesn't it? I will say that it's crazy depending on who your perspective on this and what the end goal is. I mean, when you talk to college administrators, first of all, by law, they have to do something, mm -hmm. right? This is by law what they have to do. This is the process that's set up to handle a Title IX complaint. So they, but in talking to college administrators, I mean, they believe they have a fair process. They have this goal of it being educational. Um, and they believe they can give consequences, they can connect survivors to resources. So, I mean, it's crazy depending for, for Joe Cohn. I mean, he believes that, that the accused also is not getting their due process in these cases. And that's becoming more and more of an issue as more of these cases go to hearings. Now, you did, you'd also uh, interviewed, of course, uh, Lee Mintz, uh, the Title IX administrator at the time of this case in 07 and, and still is there. And uh, what was the purpose of the hearing, according to Lee Mintz? So Lee Mintz is the, the deputy Title IX coordinator, and she investigated Jennifer's case. She still holds that position today. And, and again, you know, for her, these cases or um, this process is to be educational. So don't forget, like for some of these violations, right, the student writes an essay, mm -hmm. right? The student is sent to counseling. If it's for hazing or drinking or something like that, they could be sent, you know, to counseling for six months or something. So it's in cases of sexual assault where you're talking about expulsion, yeah. um, suspension. And what happened to, uh, to Jennifer's uh, assailant in this case? Uh, he was found guilty um, after it took a year, um, and at the end of that year, uh, she was Jennifer was notified by phone, never in writing, that he was found guilty and would be expelled. Um, that, according to the university, speaking generally about how it works, that is put on his transcript. He went on to finish his undergraduate degree at a local university, and then actually went on to get his law degree at George Washington. She too got a law degree. Um, and then they ended up this summer both in the same room taking the California the bar, bar exam. exam. Yeah, that was a remarkable yeah. part of the story. It's right there a row apart. We do have a clip from uh, Jennifer and her uh, reaction to the SDSU's resolution of the case. Let's hear that. He is telling all his friends a completely different story than what happened. And I'm not allowed to say, no, look, the school believes me. I went through this hearing and they believed me. They saw all the evidence and they expelled him. So what she's referring to there is when she got that phone call that he was going to be expelled, she was told by the administrator at that point that she was not allowed to tell anybody because that would violate the accused privacy rights. That goes against federal guidelines about how these should be handled. The school did not respond to um, my emails recently about whether that policy has changed or not. it just appears to not. be wrong what she was told. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, it was a remarkable story, and I would encourage uh, everyone to take a look at all of all of your work. Uh, Jennifer, now today, is um, on an to attorney. her career in attorney yeah. in, in here in San attorney. Diego, mm -hmm. and it's been that long. All right, we are going to shift gears now. <clears throat> Bumper stickers urging support for veterans are common, especially in military towns like San Diego, and there are plenty of charities soliciting contributions, but just where are those dollars going? The rating agency Charity Watch has poor grades for most charities purporting to help military veterans. And Jeff, uh, why did half these groups get an F in this recent uh, study? Uh, the methodology this watchdog group uses to rate charities uh, factors in salaries, uh, fundraising expenses, overhead expenses, consulting, things that don't go directly to benefit veterans. Uh, the reason this matters, especially in a community like San Diego, is Americans are incredibly generous and donate a third of a trillion dollars to charity last year. Wow. Um, billions of that go to veterans, police, firefighters, sympathetic causes that people naturally want to support. Uh, what Charity Watch does and what the Watchdog report I wrote uh, found is that a lot of that money doesn't go to direct services or even in grants to help needy veterans. It goes to salaries, fundraising expenses, and uh, other things that most donors wouldn't uh, gravitate towards supporting if they were aware of where the money was going. We're going to get into that in detail in a second, but before we do, uh, tell us about Charity Watch and the American Institute of uh, Philanthropy. What is it? What's their mission? It's a nonprofit uh, based in Chicago, uh, founded uh, a while ago, about 10, 15 years ago, mm -hmm. I think, uh, by a single guy who saw some uh, uh, gaps in the amount of reporting that people were uh, able to access. Uh, regarding chari charities they choose to support. So their mission 
is to inform donors about the value they're getting when they support charities. Mm -hmm. And they do that by uh, examining their spending. Mm -hmm. Gene? Well, we see a lot of emphasis put on the high overhead for the uh, for the fundraising outreach, and you would think, gee, in, in a place where where with Citizens United, you can raise hundreds of millions of dollars and billions of dollars for politics, you can't raise it for charities and make the same kind of margin. But to what extent is this group finding not just a high preponderance of the uh, administrative costs, if you will, but waste, fraud, and abuse of the money that comes in? Uh, well, as in politics, that's uh, difficult to define uh, what waste and fraud and abuse is. <laughs> Let's make it wide uh, My fraud may not be your fraud. Uh, we didn't find any wrongdoing. Okay. Uh, well, there have been a few cases that were prosecuted by attorneys general around the country, okay. uh, including California. Slush funds, travel, um, et cetera. Where, where, or self-dealing, where they're, okay. they're making side arrangements with, in, in, in the cases I, I specifically uncovered, uh, these big, and we focused on big charities because they, 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 generate tons of uh, donations, tens of millions of dollars a year. Lots of them are spending tens of millions of dollars a year on direct mail and things like that. The reason that's significant is because in a couple of cases I found the charity executives were negotiating private deals with the vendors who were receiving the fundraising dollars and returning money in separate deals that are non-disclosable to the charity executives. Uh, so that's obviously problematic. The problem with uh, prosecuting these guys is that uh, in the state of California they have 1,200 lawyers in the Department of Justice, only 10 assigned to the charitable trust sector, so very little prosecution actually gets done when there is waste, fraud, and abuse. The, uh, so they're looking at overhead and their fundraising expense, investments, and these are the parameters whether you're running it uh, well or you're running not. Mm -hmm. And we mentioned how many got failing grades and, and it looked like C plus is a pretty good grade. Your story noted that the Wounded Warriors, everybody's pretty familiar with that group. Um, actually, uh, C plus doesn't sound great until you compare it with how many folks failed. Right. The majority of them got C's, D's, and F's. Uh, the vast majority. The Charity Watch group, the most recent report examined, I think, 53 separate organizations. Almost half got, 26 got F grades. A number of others got D's and C's. Only a handful got A's. Um, and. Uh, the bottom line that we try to tell people is that if you're going to give money, you should research where the money is going. There are a number of rating agencies beyond Charity Watch that do the same service and just do some education about where you're going to give your money. How little percentage is we talking about for those that got the failing or the minus C grades? What, 10, 15 uh, percent? One, one, shop, one shop I found in Connecticut raised $9 million uh, in 2012, which is the most recent okay. year they're behind on their tax filing. Uh, they spent $8 million of that fundraising. Um, and they granted only, gosh, I think it was $68,000 out of the $9 million they raised. Uh, I don't know how much you know this, but is this sector somehow worse compared to other kind of charitable groups? Um, I hate to say worse. Uh, there's, there's a lot of money spent on fundraising. Uh, yes, uh, veterans especially, also police, fire, sympathetic causes like that because they're so right for... Americans are generous people. They want to help, and they do that by donating money. Um, when the money is not always expended well, that's when it becomes a problem. Uh, yes, veterans groups are one of the most uh, uh, abused sectors of the charitable industry. Yeah, there are, I should point out, uh, of the folks getting C minus or better grades, some uh, uh, included the Intrepid Fallen Heroes Fund, Bob Woodruff Family Foundation, Operation Homefront USO, Habitat for Humanity. I think uh, the audience is familiar with some of those. Some prominent vets charities got failing grades, though, and that would include AMVETS, Paralyzed Veterans of America, Vietnam Veterans of America. Let's take Paralyzed Veterans that you uh, you wrote about. Uh, why did they earn this, this failing grade? Uh, what, what's Charity Watch concerned about there? Spending on direct mail. Uh, that group raised, uh, I think it was about $82 million in the most recent fiscal year. They spent almost half of it on fundraising, telemarketing, and direct mail. Uh, they spent another, uh, uh, I think it was 10 or $12 million on salaries. Uh, now, they'll tell you they need to spend that to raise the money to do their good works. Uh, they're sitting on, I think, about $300 million in Oh, excuse me, I'm getting that one mixed up with a different organization. Mm -hmm. But some of these groups, uh, they take their donations and they put them in the bank, and they don't deliver any direct services. Mm -hmm. They'll tell you that's okay because they're trying to build their bank balance and s s uh, serve in perpetuity. They don't want to go out of business. Uh, so there's nothing improper about that, 
But again, donors need to be aware that the money they're giving isn't going to direct services. It's going to sustain the organization, which is then delivering services in perpetuity. That's the model. Now, when you contacted some of these uh, charities, like Paralyzed Veterans of America, what, what was the response uh, regarding this report? Uh, well, with them specifically, they came to the phone, and we had a, a lengthy conversation, and they answered all my questions, so I give them great credit for that. Other groups were not so accommodating and simply didn't return our calls or issued statements that were, uh, in some cases, off point. Uh, so the response uh, varied across the spectrum. Uh, Paralyzed Veterans' position is that uh, they need to spend money to raise money, and the money they spend is, is done as effectively and authoritatively as it can be so that they continue to deliver the services they have for s some decades. Well, it's a terrific story, and as you say, donors really should be aware of this. I'm afraid we're out of time, but we'll look for follow-ups on this story. That does wrap up another week of stories at the KPBS Roundtable. I'd like to thank my guests, Gene Cubison of KNSD News, Angela Crone of KPBS News, and Jeff McDonald of UT San Diego. A reminder, all the stories we discussed today are available on our website, kpbs.org. I'm Mark Sauer. Thanks for joining us today on the Roundtable.